Once again, take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 102. I'm going to cover the whole chapter, but I'm just going to read the first seven verses. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come unto thee. Hide not thy face from me in the day when I am in trouble. Incline thine ear unto me in the day when I call. Answer me speedily. For my days are consumed like smoke and my bones are burned as a hearth. My heart is smitten and withered like grass so that I forget to eat my bread. By reason of the voice of my groaning, my bones cleave to my skin. I am like a pelican in the wilderness. I am like an owl of the desert. I watch and I and am as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. The title of the message this morning is Christ the King in His Humiliation. Christ the King in His Humiliation. This psalm is a prophecy concerning the sufferings of Christ, His humiliation and death and the gracious results that will flow from it. Some think that David penned <coughs> this psalm as the time of Absalom's rebellion, but it is clear that its greater application is to the Lord. Look at verse 25 and 26, if you would. Of old hast thou laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment. As a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. Hold your place at 102 there and turn over to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 10. Hebrews 1 and verse 10 through 12. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. So see, we can see the, the closeness there of these scriptures. Its title is, even though I've given it a title, Christ the King and the Humiliation, the title is A Prayer of the Afflicted. When he is overwhelmed and poureth out his complaint before the Lord. It is a plea for, an, for the unchanging God when the believer is overwhelmed with trouble. Remember that our Lord endured all. He endured everything. And he knew that we would be struggling, that we would suffer, that we would have issues, we would have problems, and he took it upon himself to do that and much more. So he's already taken upon himself everything that we will ever go through or everything that we would have trials or tribulation about. Christ has already endured those. If you turn to Matthew 26, again, holding your place here in Psalm. Matthew chapter 26, starting at verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit you here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. 
So our Lord, in his humanity, became sorrowful. And his thoughts and his being were very heavy at this point. Then said he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup, cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, what could ye not watch with me an hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He was trying to give them an admonition here, trying to help them because we know what happened. All the disciples took off and left him. John stayed with him for a while in, in, the, in, the, in the room there when he was being uh, tried by the high priest and, and dealt with. He stayed there for a while. Peter was outside denying him three times. So he was in the courtyard and he did that. And Christ had these things on his mind. And he knew what was going to take place and what was going to happen. And they were going to be tempted. They were going to be tried. Eventually, John took off. They all went away. And they uh, were in a room at one point, And I think Peter was that says, I'm going fishing. Forget all this stuff. And that said, well, we're going too. And then we know later on that the Lord came to them all in their bewilderment and their weakness so we know that Christ is watching out for him at this point, and it's vexing him. It's making him very sorrowful and troubled that these things are going to take place. But that isn't the crutch of the matter here. Verse 42, and he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he lifted them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Behold, he is at hand that doth betrayed me. Now, if you turn over again, holding your place, don't lose your place in the psalm there. We will be going back to that. But Luke's gospel, chapter 22. And I pondered this verse of scripture. And there's a couple things in here. As many times as I've read it, I've never seen it until... Um, this message was laid upon me to present, and it's just, it's just amazing how the Lord works, and he gives us in the time of our need, when we need it, at the right time, and I felt that was the right time that I received it. And that's not just for me, that's for all of us. So Luke 22 Luke 22 and verse 39. And he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples also followed him. Now, Gethsemane was in the area of the Mount of Olives. And when, so it's the same place, so you don't get confused. It's the same place that Matthew is talking about. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, pray that ye enter not into temptation. He was wanting them to take on a responsibility that they would pray and ask God for the strength that they needed in the time of temptation, the time of a trial, a time of their tribulation. 
And here's the part I've never seen before. And you may have, that's fine. It's well and good that you have. I just never had. And there's a reason for this, and we'll see in a minute, but it says, and there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Now we're talking about God here. We're talking about God that's come in the flesh. This is Christ, the son of God, the third person of or the second person of the Godhead, and he needs strength in his humanity. In his humiliation, he needed this strength. And being, and this is why he needed it. And the reason Luke brings this out, I believe, is because Luke was a physician. He understood. He understood a person being in this condition, this, this weakened condition, this, this point of their time in their life when they needed help. They needed strength because verse 44 says, and being in, in an agony, he prayed most earnestly and his sweat was as it were drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. And said unto them, why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. So the point here is that Jesus was in agony. Now, the Armenian, those that uh, take this verse of scripture, these two verses of scripture that we just read, what they're going to want to say is that his agony and his intensity that the sweat that was falling was drops of blood, which I took at and I said, wow, Christ shed his blood even before he went to the cross is that the reason he wanted this cup to be removed, and you can read if you got a, uh, don't do it now, but if you've got a study Bible, there's notes at the bottom of, of each paragraph or each, each verse of the scripture there. They're gonna say that the reason he was praying this and he wanted this cup removed is that he didn't wanna to go to the cross and die. Well, that's the farthest thing from the truth because before the foundation of the world, it was already decided that Christ was going to come and be the perfect sacrifice to appease God's wrath against his elect people. So that wasn't it. So what was it? Well, the cup that he really didn't want to bear was at the point of time when he took our sins upon him on the cross, God turned away. For the first time in eternity, past, present, future, Christ was alone, totally did not have the fellowship with the Father because God cannot look upon sin. And at that point, he turned away. Can you imagine the separation? I would say Christ was in agony over this. Plus, he loved his disciples. He loved his people and he knew where they were headed. They were headed. He knew Peter. He tried to warn Peter ahead of time. You're going to deny me. Oh, no way. No, Lord, I would never do that. And one day it may be coming to the point that we're going to be caught in that same situation. What will we do? I don't think any of us can say absolutely positively because I've read many things of people that have been tortured for their faith and they broke them. They denied Christ. But if you've seen what they went through and what torture that they endured you can understand and we we can't we can't be too harsh on them because i don't know how we would hold up under such scrutiny i mean these people were to the point that there was like brother you know max said this morning about nathaniel he was filleted alive and he wasn't the only one many christians died in that manner and it's, it, it's actually too horrible to even talk about uh, the way early Christians died in the arena, things that there was done to them. And it, it, it's just, uh, well, for us, it's appalling. There was a point, and it's recorded in Matthew. And in fact, the agony part there, the angels coming, you'll find out nowhere else in Scripture that that happened. Luke brings that out. That there was an angel came and ministered unto him and helped him in his, his time of his humanity. He didn't sin. 
There's nothing that Christ did that was wrong. It's just that it shows his humanity and what he did for us. So, see, he was doing things for us before he even went to the cross. Him coming alone before the foundation of the world that he, he made that decision and that choice to God that I, he would be the one that goes. He would be the one that paid that price. But we can sum it all up, and in, in, you don't have to turn there, but in Matthew chapter 29 and verse 46, Christ, when it was over with and done, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So we know that there was a point in time that God forsook his son. And the reason is because, again, God cannot look upon sin, nor could he, uh, you know, uh, look upon him at the time he took and bear our sins. So let's go back to the psalm. And the first point I like to make is our Lord's dependence on God in the hour of his humiliation. His dependence was upon God. Everything that he came to do was I can to do the will of my father and the will of my father I will do. So he came to that place. So in Psalm 102, once again, we have this, this, this prayer of affliction when our Lord was overwhelmed and he poureth out his complaint before the Lord, which we would, we're not looking at as a complaint like we would complain, but he was hoping to avoid this situation that he would lose contact with the Father, even though it was for a brief moment. So again, our Lord's dependence on God in the hour of his humiliation. In verse 1 and 2, it says, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come unto thee. Hide not thy face from me in the day when I am in trouble. Incline thine ear unto me in the day when I call. Answer me speedily. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Answer me. You know, tell me, show me. There was no answer because God could not have anything to do at that point in time. So he pleads with God to take notice of his affliction. It should be our greatest desire that God would hear our prayers for if God does not hear our prayers, then our prayers are in vain. It should be our greatest hope that God, upon hearing our prayers, will be moved to action on our behalf. It should be evidence of God's interest in us when he manifested himself in our behalf. And that's what Christ did. He manifested himself on our behalf, even though it cost even though the cost was great, he still did it. Not hiding his face from us, but answering us speedily. God does that because when God looks upon us now, he doesn't see us as sinners, but he sees Christ in us. So Christ's blood covers and the, the blood covers all our iniquities. So he no longer sees that. But what he does see is the blood of Jesus Christ and Christ in us. Verse 3 and through 7 said, my, For my days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are burned as a hearth. My heart is smitten and withered like grass, so that I forget to eat my bread. By reason of my voice, of my groaning, my bones cleave to my skin. I am like a pelican in the wilderness. I am like an owl in the desert. I watch and am as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. So he pleads with God once again to take note of the lowest state he finds himself in. There's no lower state that Christ ever was in. From eternity past to eternity future, he never was in this condition, nor will he ever be ever again. His body is weak and feverish, verse 3. His soul is sorrowful and depressed, verse 4. 
His throat was filled with groans and sighings. Verse 5 and in verse 6 and 7, his, seven, his entire being was lonely and deserted. The psalm brings all this out of what Jesus went through even before he went to the cross. He says that he's like a pelican in the wilderness that, well, there's no food for a pelican in the wilderness. Pelican needs the sea, needs the water to refresh himself for food, like an owl in a desert making doleful, miserable sounds. And like a sparrow alone on a housetop, no friends to comfort or help. That was Jesus. So when we look at his humiliation, his humanity, we see, look at all what Christ did for us before he even went to the cross. See, his sorrowful, his ang agony that he went through even before he got there. So we need to take note and understand that there was more that Christ did for us than sometimes we even pay attention to and that we see when he did this for sinners such as we are. Our Lord's devilish enemies is the second point, enemies and their design. He was evil spoken of by his enemies and all manner of evil was said against him. Look at verse 8. Mine enemies reproach me all the day and they that are mad against me are sworn against me. They hated him worth, I mean, there is no greater hated, hatred that they had for the Lord Jesus Christ. He fasted and wept under the yoke of oppression and saw it as a token of God's displeasure. Verse 9 and 10 said, For I have eaten ashes like bread and mingled my drink with weeping because of thine indignation and thy wrath, for thou hast lifted me up and cast me down. So we can understand the fullness of Jesus' agony here. He looked upon himself as a dying man without any hope. Verse 11, my days are like a shadow that declineth and I am withered like grass. Christ was totally alone. There was no help for him, nor strength for him. He knew that, that once his father had left him at that moment, that it will be the lowest point of his eternity, if you want to put it that way. He never would ever experience anything such as that ever again. Then thirdly, our Lord's delight in God's final design for Zion. It says in verse 12 there, Well, before I read that, all his suffering was for a purpose. In Isaiah chapter 53, if you want to turn there, Isaiah 53, verse 11 and 12, we can see what this purpose consisted of. Isaiah 53, 11, he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many. And I'd like you to note the word many there twice in Isaiah 53. It's not all, it's many, and made intercession for the transgressors. He interceded. He interceded for us then and he continues to intercede because he's on the right hand of God the Father doing that very thing, making intercession for you and I. We are dying creatures, but Christ in Christ, we have an interest in, ever, in the everlasting God. In verse 12, it says, But thou, O Lord, shalt endure forever in thy remembrance unto all generations. So our life is 
a transit or not lasting, but his is permanent. Our friends die, but our God lives on. Poor Zion may now be in distress, but there is a day of relief and victory coming. Well, those who, who have uh, cast away the Jews and, and put them in a place where they shouldn't be should read this verse here in verse 13. Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion for the time to favor her, yea, the set time is come. So their hope of deliverance is built upon the goodness of God. God loves his people. There is no doubt about that. Even though he's, he's been angry with them, they're still his people. And he will still protect them and he will take care of them as they are needed to. So the universal nature of Zion's hope we see in verse 14, 15 and 16 in, in, our, in our text there, for thy servant take, servants take pleasure in her stones and favor the dust thereof. So the heathen shall fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth thy glory. When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. Now it's amazing to note that Jesus is on the Mount of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he comes back for his thousand year reign, he's going to set his foot upon the very same place that he was and prayed. So I find that pretty amazing in itself that that's where he'll return. So again, the universal nature of Zion's hope is found there in verse 14 and 16. There will be great rejoicing among her friends there in verse 14. There will be great honor given to God of Zion by the nations and kings of the earth. Verse 15, turn to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21, 21. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gates was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it. And the lamb is the light thereof, speaking of Jesus Christ. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So all those that are in the Lamb's book of life will be there. All the lost that are upon the earth today will be destroyed and there will be none of them there. And none will walk into the, the millennial reign who are not saved at that point in time. And remember that depravity still reigns during this time. There, there we'll see the glory of God revealed. Turn over to there to 22, Revelation 22, verse 1. It says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. You know, one of the things that I've always wanted to do, and you can't, is just... Reach down into a flowing stream of water and get a drink of water. You can't do that because it's so polluted. There's all kinds of critters running around in there that'll end up killing you for sure. So you can't do that anymore. But there, 
where this place is, we'll be able to do that. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face. And that'll be amazing in itself. One will finally get to see his face. And his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. If. There's any here this morning who does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, you won't see this place. You'll never step foot in this place unless you come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Verse 16 once again says, When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. The next point is our Lord's daily blessing purchased at great cost for his own. You have to understand, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to believe sometimes that the depraved nature of man would be so arrogant to assume that without Jesus Christ, that they're going to be a part of this. They assume too much. Verse 17, the blessing of prayer. He will regard the prayer of the destitute and not despise their prayer. We are the destitute. We are the ones that are in need and have been given salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. In and through Jesus we have access to God by prayer. When he said it is finished, the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom and gave us total access to the throne of God. Paul said, come boldly. We can go boldly now to the throne room of God and ask of him what we will. Verse 18, this shall be written for the generation to come. And the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. So the blessing of eternal salvation for the souls trusting Christ in the future. It's a promise that we have. Many yet unborn will hear the gospel story and be saved. It may not be, you know, one of the main things at the conference was, and Brother Matthew had a really good message on this, that... The rapture is here now, today, right this minute. It's here. Whether it happens or not, it's here. It's at our doorstep. We do not know the exact second or minute or hour or what. We do not know that, but it's here. It's time. There's nothing else. Uh, the only thing he made a statement to and is what I we've talked to together about this before is that at the last soul that's saved. They don't even have to be baptized in a church course. We believe that once they come out of the water, that that's it. If that's the last soul to be saved and baptized into the church, that's it. Some will say, well, there's going to be souls saved in the, in the, in the, during the tribulation time. And that's true. But we're talking about this age. We're talking about the dispensation of the Gentiles, which we're in right now. And that last soul is saved and baptized in the church, then there, then, you know, there's no reason why the Lord would not come back. But they all agreed that it's now. We've seen it. So the blessing of those under affliction by Satan and imprisoned in his jail will be released and brought. To grace, verse 19 and 20. For he hath looked down from the height of his sanctuary from heaven. Did the Lord behold the earth? 
to hear the groaning of his of this prisoner to loose those that are appointed to death. The blessing of establishing God's work upon the earth, both among his elect and his holy city. In verse 21, to declare the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. Great mercy is displayed by God on earth through the sacrifice of Christ. The blessing of gathering us into God's family to serve his cause there in verse 22. When the people are gathered together in the, in the kingdom to serve the Lord. Many believe this point in time that will be boring. I find nothing boring about heaven at all. We will both draw in ours and us our collective strength to worship and serve the Lord eternal. See, if the angel came to give Jesus strength, you don't think Jesus is giving us strength daily as we ask or need it? And I believe that because the Bible says that the angels are in front of God. They're in his presence. And the very time that you and I will need the help or the strength, he will send them and they'll be there at that point in time in our life to protect and keep us safe. I, be I believe that and I experienced even before I was saved. Amen. Lastly, our Lord's diligent work and delightful nature. Verse 23 He weakened my strength in the way he shortened my days. He takes account of our imminent danger and frail nature. James chapter 4, if you'd like to turn there, James chapter 4 and verse 13. James says here, he says, Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow for what is your life it is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanish away for that ye ought to say if the Lord will we shall live and do this or that he hears our prayers within the framework of his own eternal nature and Godhead, look at verse 24. And I said, O oh my God, take me not away in the midst of my days. Thy years are throughout all generations. So he fa fails not to take and, and takes the long view in all our requests so that our best interest is served. God does not want us to fail. And he knows what is best for us, even though we don't know what is best for us. We need to seek him daily and find out what is our best interest in serving you. That's what we want. What can I do to serve you to the fullest? And he will give us that. Just as uh, creation is built upon his eternal nature, so is his interest in us. Verse 25 through 27. Of old hast thou laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, as a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. So creation is now... That is no new work with God and neither is recreation, which is our redemption. We can neither continue our own existence nor give being to others, but the Lord is. And he is the maker of all things that are therefore when our affairs are the lowest ebb, we need not despair because he can restore us. No matter how things are going, he can restore us. 
And then the last verse there, a comfortable assurance. The children of thy servants shall continue and their seed shall be established before thee. Since God is eternal, his work will be eternal. Those who look for God's work to fail will be sadly disappointed. Those who look for God's word to fail will look in vain. Those who look for God's will to fail will be crushed beneath its eternal rule. The Bible tells us as Christ spoke and said that the gates of hell will not prevail against us. And that's what he promised and that's what he means. Those who look for God to change will travel a false way to hell. God will never change, nor has he ever changed. In conclusion, God will, through Jesus Christ, establish his work on the earth and its glorious results will be assured as God's people gather in the heavenly Zion to sing of his eternal nature and glory. Won't that be great? We'll all have angels' voices. We'll be able to sing and not even be concerned about how we sound. As Moses and the children of Israel sang of God's deliverance from Egypt, so we will sing on the shores of eternity of our deliverance from Satan. And that's where it lies. Satan is out to destroy us. He is doing everything possible that he can. He will continue to do everything possible that he can. To destroy you, to destroy me, to destroy this church. And he will not quit until we are, of course, taken out. And then he still will continue on. So we pray that the Lord will bless you with this message today. And that you will ponder all that Christ has done for us. Everything that he's accomplished for us. Up until the point that he lost the connection between him and God at one point. It's sad in a way. But we're glad that he did. Because we have been redeemed by his blood. May God bless his word to your heart.